my name is Alicia Seiger. I'm the managing director of the Sustainable Finance Initiative. Uh, I have uh, a background in carbon markets, um, including uh, having been the first employee at TerraPass back in the early 2000s, which was one of the first carbon offset retailers, uh, and um, and then have been uh, writing about and thinking about and trying to optimize uh, carbon markets uh, ever since. Um, but I am not the star of today's show. The star of today's show is Mark Roston. Uh, Mark uh, comes to the Sustainable Finance Initiative, where he is a re senior research fellow with 25 years of experience in the asset management industry, including senior positions uh, ranging from quantitative equity to private equity and uh, deep expertise in insurance, insurance markets. He has a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago, and we have been very fortunate to have him on our team and to bring his uh, practitioner expertise combined with his academic acumen to bear on these questions of climate and capital markets and how to um, kind of steer out of some of the ditches we've been uh, falling into in, in this sort of made up world of finance and climate um, and get us back into uh, more structured and rigorous and tried and tested uh, frameworks for actually managing carbon and pricing carbon. So um, what we're going to do here today is I'm going to turn it over to Mark for about a 20 minute presentation plus minus. We'll see how much I interrupt him. Um, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative to, to, to do that interrupting. Um, and then I'm going to ask him some questions in a moderated Q&A for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we're going to open up the floor uh, to you all and hear from you and your questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. All right. Thank you all for joining us at whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. Um, uh, what we are going to discuss today is um, somewhat of a um, novel take on carbon markets with an emphasis on what's going on with avoided emissions and how that fits in with a carbon market. And of course, the context of the of the week, of the month, of the quarter is um, uh, COP, and all of the attention that you may have seen has been focused on uh, Article Six. Um, for those of you who don't uh, know, I know I'm not able to advance. Article Six is the framework for reduction collaboration between uh, different countries. Uh, it sort of splits into two categories. Uh, Article 6.2 is about bilateral transactions between two countries. Um, Article 6.4 is what we might think of and has been described as somewhat of a UN-centric centralized carbon market. And what we are hopefully going to uh, what, what you will hopefully come away from this discussion with a better understanding of why we think some reasonably significant challenges remain with Article 6 and its implementation. And that will be um, in the context of how we're thinking about carbon markets and what we are calling carbon markets today. Um, so what you will hopefully come away from is from this discussion with a with the, the conclusion I would like you to reach is that carbon accountability demands a budget constraint. And one of the challenges is that we are not actually operating in a world of a budget constraint, that many of the um, mechanisms and uh, 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 trading designs and trading mechanisms that we've developed um, assume a budget constraint exists when a budget constraint on carbon emissions doesn't actually exist and arguably never will. And we want to unpack that a little bit. The second thing I want you to come away from this discussion about is that these things we call carbon markets mostly trade things that aren't carbon. And what we will try to explain is most of the things that they that carbon markets trade aren't even linked to carbon and probably don't even exist. Uh, this leads to 
a question about market integrity. So market integrity is a very fashionable thing to talk about. And in the context of how we're thinking about and describing carbon markets, what we want to, what, what we would like you to understand is that carbon and carbon removals might be permanent. Um, they are often not permanent. And there are some shortcomings in the market structure of carbon markets that makes it as if they are, that the markets trade as if they are all permanent when they aren't. And that is seriously impairing the markets, the market success. Additionally, uh, ironic using the word additional for those of you who are aware, but additionally, um, avoidances, uh, carbon emission or, or GHG emissions avoidances are almost by definition not permanent. And that leads us to wanting to talk about a refined definition of carbon market integrity. Um, first, we have to take a little bit of a painful dive into modeling climate economics. Most of you are probably familiar with integrated assessment models. This is the classic sort of model that try to link uh, global economic activity and global economic modeling to uh, climate models. So the way these models work, and uh, DICE is probably the most well-known one of these models. Um, it, it, what, what these models are doing is saying, well, I have economic activity and economic activity leads to greenhouse gas emissions and greenhouse gas emissions lead to, uh, lead to environmental harm. And what the DICE model does, for example, is it links population, fossil fuel stocks, energy generation, and technological dynamics like deployment of new technology. And they drive re these regional interactions leading to emissions, temperature change, and damages. In a particular example of Nordhaus's uh, model runs from his book, uh, A Question of Balance, I want to read this to you because it, it's very important to understand what's going on in this model. This run finds a trajectory for emissions reductions that balances current abatement cost against future damages from global warming. It assumes complete participation and compliance. The marginal cost of emissions reductions are always and everywhere equal to the marginal benefits of reducing emissions in terms of lower damages. Now, this is a incredibly precise and, and deep statement. This basically says that in the optimal run, the economy is solving for these marginal costs and marginal benefits always and everywhere and across time. And so this is and, and what happens is once we deviate from Nordhaus's optimal policy run, we're starting to deal with things that are closer to reality. This model, roughly speaking, uses 18 equations and a whole bunch of parameters. Um, I didn't actually count how many parameters, but it's a it's a complex exercise. And I think it's a very it, it's it's an interesting exercise for the purposes that IAM modelers use it for, which is understanding possibilities. I don't find it is particularly useful for economic intuition. Um, what I think is a far more um, useful model for economic in intuition is the model proposed by Becker, Murphy, and Topel in 2010. Um, what they are doing, and I strongly encourage anyone to go and read the hoteling paper from 1931, The Economics of Exhaustible Resources. I, I think you should read it because it's a fun read because of the style of writing papers in 1931. It's sort of filled with double entendres about the environment and about natural resources because this paper is actually about the questions that were confronting the world at the time of saying, well, 
if I have an oil well, and what's the optimal rate at which I should extract the oil from that oil well? Because it's a finite, exhaustible resource. And how do we think about the pricing dynamics of that extraction problem? The irony, of course, is that Becker, Murphy, and Topel flipped this problem on its head uh, well outside of the context of what hoteling is worrying about. But they're basically saying, instead of thinking about the exhaustible resource being um, how much oil is in the well or how many trees are in the forest that I'm going to uh, log or, you know, what's the rate of, um, you know, mineral extraction of the, you know, the, the copper I need out of a mine, they're saying the resource is the ability for the atmosphere to absorb CO2. So you could think of this as saying today, uh, I don't remember the number offhand. It's roughly 422 parts per million, I believe, for CO2 in the atmosphere. So the way to think about what Becker, Murphy, and Topel are doing is to say, well, let's just suppose we have a budget constraint that says we can't go over 500. What do we do? How do we optimally consume the capacity of the atmosphere to absorb CO2? Now, you could you could say that's a very hard number to set. You are right. But we're talking about conceptually, and the model can be adapted to allow a whole lot of flexibility and dynamics in that budget constraint. But in essence, what we're saying is this model focuses entirely on what's the CO2 in the atmosphere, because that's what's causing the damage, rather than saying, let's you know build a complex model of an economy and talk about the dynamics of changing parameters and changing this or that production function. We're simply saying, look, how do we, con how do we use up our ability to absorb CO2 into the atmosphere? This becomes, this, for those of you who are um, familiar with sort of standard tools of economics. This is a, a, a very straightforward uh, optimization problem. For those of you who have never seen an, a, an economics optimization problem, you're looking at that and saying, I don't know what the heck is going on. Um, but it's a pretty straightforward uh, optimization problem to be solved here. What the result of this to be clear, is that the Becker-Murphy-Topel model is essentially identical to the Nordhaus optimal policy model. Marginal cost of emissions equals the marginal benefits of those emissions always, everywhere, through time. An important result of this model is that we don't need things like the social cost of carbon. We don't need things like subjective discount rates for you know, future humanity's well-being. It, the, the model endogenizes just about everything. The problem, as I noted in the introduction, is that it depends on this budget constraint. As long as this budget constraint is, is held, that is, everyone is operating off of the same calculation that says the atmosphere can absorb this many you know units in parts per million of co2 and we all agree in that narrow circumstance the marginal utility of removals equals the marginal utility of avoided emissions or the marginal utility of emissions so if we all abide by that budget constraint let's suppose you know, I want to give some of my right to emit under that budget constraint to Alicia. That's a perfectly fine thing to do because she and I are acknowledging and we're bound by the same budget constraint. As soon as we violate those budget constraints, though, the whole model goes off the rails. And that's one of the challenges of carbon markets under you know, what I guess I would describe as non-binding global budget constraints. And, you know, my view is we are unlikely to ever get to binding global budget constraints. So we have to deal with the problem slightly differently. 
So just as a, as a thought exercise, for those of you who may, may have some rough understanding of what was going on in the prior optimization problem, we can reconstruct, we can modify the Becker-Murphy-Topel model to say, look, part of the world operates under a constraint, part of the world doesn't. So the best way to think about this is what does a given compliance market look like? Or what does a buyer's club look like? So for example, we could describe the EU's system for saying the EU has a budget constraint as saying, that's great. There's a whole bunch of countries in Europe that are abiding by a budget constraint, but most of the world doesn't. And so in the, so the budget constraint only applies to a, a to a fraction of the economy. This can be a large fraction. This can be a small fraction. You could think about the California carb market as being a market where an extremely small fraction of the world abides by the by the the, the constraint. The EU is a slightly bigger market. In fact, you can even think about a corporate pledge as a tiny, tiny, tiny little fraction abiding by the budget you know, that the CEO sort of arbitrarily announces exists. The challenge if, is if you, you know, play around with a model like this, you very quickly find that in the optimization exercise, activities will shift. Activities will just shift outside of the constrained part of the economy into the unconstrained part of the economy. And that is basically everything you need to know or everything you should be thinking about in a general equilibrium setting when all of these budget constraints are sort of partial equilibrium exercises. So what does it mean to say the EU abides by a budget that the EU invents? That's very nice, but there's no reason to believe it's the right budget constraint. And there's no reason to believe that you know, the EU doesn't successfully, depending on your perspective, or the, I, I suppose I should say unsuccessfully, shift all of their emissions activities outside of the borders of the EU. Um, that's the challenge with budget constraints that don't cover the total, the, the, the totality of the economy. So let's turn quickly to carbon markets in this context. What are carbon markets? We often hear the term offsets. I put it in quotes with a question mark because I don't like the term offsets as much as the market seems to use it. There's, there's two big markets. There's the voluntary markets. Voluntary carbon markets trade avoidances and removals. You can think of avoidances as things like, you know, Party A pays Party B not to emit carbon. This can vary from, you know, a, a, I can pay someone to not cut down trees to I can pay someone to not build a coal-fired power plant. Removals are, you know, much more clearly um, actions that are capturing carbon in physical form. So we can talk about removals that are technology-based, such as direct air capture and mineralization. We can talk about nature-based removals, such as um, uh, you know, reforestation, where I'm growing new trees that are capturing carbon. The challenge here is that all avoidances require constraints that are basically arbitrary boundaries to allow for measurement. So if I am preventing someone from causing emissions, if I'm paying someone to not avoid, uh, to not emit, you know, now and into the future, I have to consider what's my time horizon, what's the geography, and what are the potential substitute goods to understand if these avoidances actually exist over time. Because what happens is an economy responds to incentives and constraints. So for example, if I have a project that's going to avoid deforestation and support reforestation in one country, it's very easy to monitor the country. It could be possible to monitor the nearby countries, maybe. 
It is not possible to say that if I, for example, am going to halt deforestation and enhance reforestation in one particular country, that I'm not going to start importing cut down trees from very far away. Or I'm, you know, for example, going to substitute trees, something else for the trees in the residential construction project that I was considering. So we've got this challenge that actually knowing that avoidances persist through time requires these arbitrary boundaries. And very often, if you look at the details of of emissions avoidance projects, they're very clearly describing these arbitrary boundaries. And we have to recognize that these boundaries are arbitrary and not really, um, you know, they, they are they are artificial constructions of a partial equilibrium. They are not real things. Again, for those of you with more economics knowledge, this is just sort of an exercise in elasticities of substitution. Removals, on the other hand, don't depend on these on these this notion of arbitrary constraint, but removals vary in, in, in risk. We have different kinds of risk that we can describe. So we have measurement error. So for example, if I capture tons of carbon in trees, I don't have particularly precise measurements of that, that tonnage. I'm making reasonable guesses. I can have delivery uncertainty. So a, a great example of that uh, besides trees, because I don't know exactly how quickly they'll grow and exactly when they will deliver tonnage, but I have projects like uh, enhanced rock weathering where I can take a guess as to when the, the, the carbon will be delivered, but I have a whole lot of uncertainty about exactly when it will be delivered. Finally, I can have catastrophic reversal risk. So think of this as you know, I I have my forest, it's growing. I have a good understanding of how close and how quickly it's growing. I have some delivery uncertainty. I have some measurement error. And then boom, all of a sudden a wildfire takes out the whole thing. Um, the way carbon markets work today is to ignore both the um, risk of removals and this risk that we don't actually know how long avoidance persists. Carbon markets today trade with these certificates issued by a verification agency, where the first thing a company does after they buy the certificate, saying, you know, I bought this certificate promising that I avoided some emissions, or I bought this certificate saying I removed some carbon, they immediately tear it up and throw it away. They call that in the carbon markets retirement. And what that does is in fact incentivizes not caring about this risk that exists in both avoidances and in removals. Just briefly on compliance markets, compliance markets don't trade carbon at all. At least in voluntary markets, we can say the removal side of this is carbon trading. Compliance markets simply trade permission slips. Some government authority says you're allowed to emit if you pay this fee to us. That's not carbon trading, that's permission slips. And by the way, sometimes they have mechanisms that allow them to increase the number of permission slips based on creating avoidances or creating removals but they, the avoidances and removals that enter the compliance market still have these risk problems. What I wanna do as a thought exercise in understanding what's going wrong in those carbon market exercises is let's work backwards. We're gonna work backwards from, let's say we all have agreed we're gonna be net zero in 2050. Well, what does that mean for permission slips? In 2050, permission slips cannot exist. There is no capacity for there to be any government saying there's permission to emit. Avoidances can't trade because all emissions are going to require a removal. That's what net zero means. 
Net zero <laughs> means if I emit, I must remove. This is the basis of our work on emissions liability management. But in fact, you know, we're we are encouraging people to think about emissions liability management between now and a net zero pledge. But the the bottom line is if we pledge net zero in 2050, that means no more permission slips, no more avoidances. Because if after 2050, if I pay Alicia to not avoid emissions, that doesn't accomplish anything because I still have if I still have emissions, I have to remove mine. It's great that I'm paying Alicia to you know, do something useful, but it's not solving my problem of my emissions. So our view is that carbon markets today need to become better aligned with the carbon markets of the future. Why is this? Because markets and prices are about are about information and incentives. So we need to be trading things today that are both useful and are, are translatable into the world we expect to operate in in the future. So for example, can we trade offsets that transfer risks across these sub markets. So what I mean by that is, well, if I'm trading something in the EU ETS, what does it mean to the CARB system? Removals are transferable across those markets. They don't violate the global budget constraint that we're all saying we want to abide by, or California is not violating its budget constraint, or the EU is not violating its budget constraint by trading actual removals. Can we align trading across compliance and voluntary markets? Well, a net zero pledge in 2050 says we have to be doing that. Um, it's a bit of a sidetrack, so I'm probably going to shortchange this, but I'll just say there's mechanisms to do this if we convert compliance markets into delivery of actual carbon instead of permission slips trading. Let's briefly turn to market integrity. This is a hot topic. The ICVCM and various other organizations are often leading us down this path of saying carbon markets have integrity if they minimize leakage, they prove additionality, and they're permanent. We think that's not a particularly satisfying answer. Hopefully, you understood from the prior discussion that absent a global budget constraint that binds on everyone, leakage in the avoidance market is inevitable. There is no possible way to prevent leakage. It's just about elasticity of substitution between products and time. Therefore, we cannot conclude that an avoidance project uh, doesn't have leakage. Maybe not with the Doug. I will try to remove the double negative. All avoidance projects will leak, and they will leak substantially absent a global budget constraint. Additionality, moreover, is a an odd special case of leakage. And this is a little bit subtle, but what's going on in additionality calculations is let's suppose Alicia is an investor and additionality is trying to claim that but for the payment from a carbon market transaction, Alicia would not invest in a project. And the challenge here is reaching that conclusion requires us to know Alicia's elasticity of substitution between this project and every other investment decision she's making. So if you think about the, the sort of the headline leakage concept, that's about publicly observable substitution effects. Additionality is in fact a divine, an attempt to divine private information that will never be revealed substitution effects. So it's a little bit subtle, but it basically says additionality is not a measurable thing. 
it's a it's a secret form of leakage. So that leads us to this problem that I would describe this notion of integrity depending on leakage, additionality, and permanence is that leakage cannot be constrained. Additionality is the messiest form of leakage that we can think of, and therefore nothing having to do with avoided emissions can be permanent. That doesn't mean avoiding emissions isn't good. It just means it can't be quantified in terms of tons of carbon that can be balanced against emissions of carbon into the atmosphere. Avoided emissions are all more or less unidentifiable and not permanent in an attributional sense. And that's an important problem to overcome in uh, the integrity of carbon markets. Our view is that there's a better answer to think about carbon market integrity. The question is, does the carbon exist and does the buyer still own it? That's how we treat market integrity of every other asset trading in the world. If I buy an asset, I turn to my auditors and I say, is the asset still there? Do I really own it? And that's a much simpler question. It also forces us to confront the idea that the carbon removals that are getting traded, some of them have more risk than others. It's a question of, do these carbon removals, do these carbon assets persist? Instead of simply saying, I bought a certificate that points to a carbon removal, I tear it up and throw it away. I've retired it. And therefore, no one is ever again has any incentive to keep track of whether that carbon removal still exists. I want to I want to leave though. I, I don't want you to think that we're saying avoiding emissions is unimportant. Avoiding emis emissions is essential, but it's not absolution. It, if I pay someone to avoid emissions, that's a great thing for me to do, especially if I'm paying someone who doesn't have the wealth to pay to avoid those emissions. But it's not resolving the fact that I've created emissions myself. We've talked to this in other contexts as this so-called plan C. If I'm a corporate that wants to do good and wants to spend money on climate action, there are great things you can do to, to help others avoid emissions. It's just, that's not, it's not good carbon accounting to say, if I'm spending money to help someone else avoid their emissions, I can't count that as tons against my obligations. And with that, I will uh, open it up to Alicia's questions or <laughs> anyone else's questions. That was great, Mark. Um, and I'm sort of laughing because you knew all my questions and you answered them. <laughs> I did. Oh, I <laughs> I'll come back to it. I mean, I'm also over here busy hiding, you know, my calculations of elasticity of substitution on every other investment decision I'm making um, as the protagonist of all your examples. Um, but but I appreciate, I mean, how, how you just walked us all through both the economics and the intuition um, undergirding effective carbon market design. And, and I hope, you know, it was a lot to consume, um, mm -hmm. for our, uh, for our audience. I, and I'm guessing, you know, people are at varying degrees of, um, comprehension. And so I, I do want to invite folks to, um, to start a queue of, of questions. And, um, and as I said, we, we certainly want to hear from students first. So, so please do, if you're a student, um, raise your hand. I'll do my best to sort of talk and and walk and chew gum at the same time and, and monitor the, the chat here to see if I can pull anything out. But let's just start. I mean, I, I, joking, not joking that you that you kind of walked through some of the things I wanted to flag. But um, I mean, so first is this question of, you know, aren't some avoided emissions necessary good um, slash good? I think, you, you know, you, you covered that. But 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 we talked about a point previously that I think is worth elevating here to this group, which is the difference between avoidance and destruction. Um, yeah. Of, yeah. So can you just highlight that um, sure. point for, for the audience? 
Yeah. So, you know, one of the most um, common uh, challenges to the question of avoided emissions are um, methane destruction and um, like uh, CFC's destruction. And I say destruction because that's an important distinction. So when we talk about like a project, for example, I'm I'm digging into um, a recent project that I came across for methane destruction that happens to be going on on the landfill that I use where I live um, and the electric uh, uh, utility where I live. And it's talking about um, uh, methane use and avoiding methane emissions. And I think it's important to understand that in a project that flares methane, um, we're talking about destroying methane. We're not talking about avoiding the emissions of methane. Um, sure, we convert it into CO2, and it's much better, you know, it's much less worse for the environment to emit the flared CO2 than to emit the methane. But it's not about avoided methane emissions. It's about destroying methane. Or the same is true, you know, with the chlorofluorocarbons, that we are destroying them. And so I, I you know, the, the closest analogy I can give for um, uh, that notion of avoided emissions is think if you could buy and destroy um, someone's proven reserves. Like, so for example, if you took someone's, you know, oil that could be pumped out of the ground and you did something to it, so it turned to rock, that would be destroying, you know, the ability to put that fossil fuel into the atmosphere. That's a very different exercise than saying, um, I am going to, um, you know, I, I am going to finance some project that is going to produce electricity with lower greenhouse gas emissions and, and at lower cost. And we have the challenge that the result of that is you've made electricity less expensive, you've increased demand for electricity, and so you're changing the forward dynamics of the system, and therefore it's extremely hard to quantify how much you actually reduced emissions. Yeah, great. That's helpful, and I, I think good insight for the for the audience. I also, again, inviting people to start their questions, but I'm going to keep going until we see some hands. Um, can you walk us through, you, you make mention several times of, of good accounting and the need for good accounting as, as a foundation um, for for effective carbon markets in in two minutes, because I see Lorenzo's got his hand up and I, I, I want to invite him into this conversation. Can you just give the like, what do we mean by that? Um, what yeah. is good good accounting? Yeah. Okay. So I think this is really important, especially in the context of Article 6. In our um, Scope 2 paper, uh, that you can find on the SFI website, we wrote about this concept called null power and how confusing the idea of null power is. So null power happens when um, the attributes of your electricity have been sold to someone else. So again, in the con in, I'll, I'll give a, an example that's near and dear to my heart, where I live, all of my power is hydro. It is it is not the case in this particular situation, but you could imagine there are provisions that allow new hydroelectric generation to generate renewable energy credits. So someone else can buy the attribute of, my, of the power generated from a hydro facility. Well, you then have to ask, what is the energy attribute of the people consuming that power? And the answer is it's null power. It's power that has no attribute which is very confusing and doesn't make very much sense to anyone, especially if the buyer of that energy attribute has very dirty power and they're claiming that buying the attribute of hydro is absolving them of the sin of their very dirty power. Now, where this comes into play is in Article 6, what you're actually doing is you're doing this with everything. 
So if I am Switzerland and I um, in, enter into some Article 6.2 transaction that allows me to take the energy attribute of some global, you know, some country in the global south because I've paid them to reduce their emissions, then what, what are the emissions of the country that I paid? Um, because I've taken their energy attribute. So this just doesn't make sense in an accounting sense. We're compounding this problem of saying, I'm just going to scoop up energy attributes all over the place, and then I'm going to leave this chaos and confusion in my wake because no one really understands what they're allowed to claim about their own energy production after that. Yeah. And that's that's what happens with the carbon accounting in avoided emissions trading. So I saw Lorenzo, you had your hand up and then you disappeared. I I, I can't see you on my screen, but I think you're here yeah, and I'm I would here. like to. Yeah, great. I'd love to invite you into the conversation if you have a question or you want to just riff on yeah, what Mark's been a, talking about. Yeah, no, thank you. Mark. And, and, and just let me great. introduce to this group, Lorenzo is is a colleague of ours um, and a, has been a fellow at the Steyer Taylor Center and, and a collaborator with us on this work. So please, Lorenzo. Great. Yeah, no. So um, thank you, Mark. I think it's it's, it's great how um, lucidly you can put together such actually like really complex thoughts. I, I wanted to maybe just come back. Actually, the methane example is a good one. I think to maybe push back on your claim that you know, nothing I think related to avoided emissions can be permanent. I think like as you as I hear your argument, there's kind of two interrelated issues that you have with avoided emissions. One is the permanence question, which is, you know, this I think idea of the incentives and the fact that they can be substituted because that's just the nature of how markets work. And then the second one is the point around the accounting for carbon and being able to, are you able to account for a uh, an emission through an offset if you don't have a budget? And I want to focus on that first part, because I think that if if there's several examples I can think of where it's hard to really think of how an avoidance credit would be or an avoidance action would be substituted. So if I go and I, um, you know, there's a lot of abandoned uh, oil wells that are leaking methane. If you mm -hmm. tap those so that they no longer emit methane, that's an avoidance credit that seems like there's not really a clear substitution there. That's very different from avoided deforestation, where you may think that you know they go to the next country to try to deforest there because they can no longer deforest in that one location. But there's other examples, right? I mean, so you can think of. Yeah, so I let yeah, yeah I, I appreciate that. I appreciate your point. And I think what I I want to distinguish between um like there is quest there are questions about attribution and of you know there's there's avoidance versus destruction, and there's there's attribution and accountability. And so first and foremost, the point is that under good carbon accounting, someone, you know, there is someone who is responsible for that leaking methane. And, and, and that leaking methane is, under good accounting is producing a liability for which that emitter is responsible. And that is, in an accounting sense, the correct way to deal with this problem, is to say, okay, someone owns that, you know, someone owns that leaking well, whether it's the private landowner, whether it's the state because it's an abandoned well, it, it, it like there is the ownership and responsibility question. Then there are questions of, um, who who is taking the credit for the exercise and so that's where it's very clear or we we need to be dealing with the fact that if i as an emitter want to go and close up a leaking methane hole 
that is not absolving me of my responsibility for my emissions. This is it is not at all reasonable accounting to say that I can stop someone else from doing something that they're not allowed to do. And I can claim that I'm allowed to do something as a result of that. I mean, just like, let's just go to the the end state of saying, you know, Alicia and I are the two last emitters on Earth. And, you know, we're each emitting 100 tons and I pay Alicia to not emit 100 tons. I can't take credit for that. Because I'm still emitting 100 tons. That doesn't take us to zero. That's not a functional way to reach net zero. And that's what we have to think about. Now, you're, the, the other part of your question, which is a fair one, is to say, um, is, that a, you know, is that avoidance permanent? And I think it's a question, you know, I could, like, I think you're roughly right that that might be an arguable exception to what I'm saying, but for the fact that we're talking about time and you are not under current functions of markets, you are not obligated to ensure, like if you want that avoidance, you put a cap on that hole and you claim the avoidance and then you tear it up and throw it away. No one is saying, that Lorenzo is bankrupt 75 years from now when that when that methane hole starts leaking again. So it's still the case that we're drawing arbitrary lines in the sand around time and geography because there's no way to hold you as the buyer of that avoidance to an actual notion of permanence. It's just not like that's not how carbon markets function today. And it's reasonably unlikely that we can cause them to function that way to handle that case you're talking about. Yeah, I, think, I mean, I'll leave it to others to come in. I have a few <laughs> follow up with you offline, Mark, but thank you. <laughs> Excellent. I want to invite, please do raise the, your hand. It's, it is hard to manage the chat sometimes, but, but Mark, well, that last conversation though back and forth, I think invites the plan C discussion because, you know, yeah. it, it can be unsatisfying to say, well, when we're doing proper accounting, X, Y, and Z happens when the reality is we're not doing proper accounting yet. Yeah. Um, we're counting carbon and we're moving, you know, our hands around and making uh, inventories line up with, you know, normative targets through various forms of gaming and um, boundary manipulation, et cetera. So, can you be a spokesperson now for Plan C? What do we mean by that? And and how does that, you know, what are what are corporates or investors to do between sure. now and good carbon accounting? Yeah, uh, that, that's great. So, so our notion of Plan C is to say there are many corporates and organizations um, that are saying, look, we want to spend dollars. We are willing to spend real money to... Um, mitigate carbon emissions. And it's often the case um, that the best way to reduce emissions are not your own. Um, you know, you, you know, so for like, I'll personally, I can, I can say, um, I think it's much more effective for the dollars I spend that I was buying solar panels in South Africa. Um, because I live on a hydro grid. Um, so there's not much I can do at my home. And so it's almost like my personal action falls in this category of plan C. I'm just saying I'm willing to spend money. So I'm going to look around and I'm going to try to find the activities where I can get the most bang for my buck. But the problem is quantifying that in tons of carbon is virtually impossible. And so, you know, so, so that's where we are quite supportive of the idea of corporates that want to spend dollars to say, sure, let's investigate the most cost effective ways to help other people reduce their emissions. That's a great, you know, philanthropic exercise, but it is not something that we think, you know, sort of aligns with, um, 
sound accounting principles such that someone should be able to say, well, I spent the dollars over here, therefore I'm entitled to, um, you know, my own carbon emissions being undone over there. I was going to ask about the, uh, the notion of the destruction and how that relates to uh, the concept of supply side offsets or offsets uh, or solutions associated with essentially going, going out and acquiring the resource, going out and acquiring the oil and gas rights or going out and acquiring the coal yeah. and just essentially putting it in a vault, so to speak. You bought yeah. minerals and then you're just not going to produce. I'm surprised you don't hear more about that. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, I, I can try. I mean, I I absolutely agree with that notion. Um, it's a little bit hard to execute. Like, and, and again, like I've spent too much time deep in the weeds on legally speaking how carbon transactions happen. But for example, there are odd things about the legal structure. Um, and you know, funny enough, when the um, when the at the end of uh, whatever in the end of Trump's administration, when the first administration, when there was this proposal to have um, uh, drilling rights in the Alaska National Wildlife Reserve, um, you know, I sort of investigated the idea: could I construct a bid to buy those rights and then just throw them away? And you can't. Like in the United States, if you acquire mineral rights, you are in essence obligated to use them. And so it's very hard under some legal regimes to say, I'm just going to start buying up, um, uh, you know, like a notion of buying up proven reserves and then basically saying, I'm going to change them from proven reserves to um, not proven reserves. Or I'm going to buy a coal mine and give it to someone who promises not to um, mine it. Like, I think we need to think very seriously about those kinds of transactions. Um, but generally speaking, they don't, you know, the, the, the carbon markets today don't really allow for them. Um, uh, but I I would call that much closer to a, a, a as you point out a destruction transaction. You know, can I destroy uh, the ability to use fossil fuels? Um, it's a tough one. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Uh, we are, we got two minutes left here. Um, always good to end these things on time, but Mark, did you want to offer any parting thoughts before we, as we're wrapping up here? No, I, you know, I have no great parting thoughts other than to say that, you know, keep in mind, I think the biggest problem we have today is that the carbon markets trade avoidances, which are produced for free. And what we need are removals that are very expensive. And as long as carbon markets are allowing things that cost almost nothing to trade in the same market as things that are very expensive, we cannot raise the financing for the things that are expect expensive. We need to have carbon markets separate avoidance from removals so that we can actually finance the capex required for removals. Yeah, great point and great point to end on. And as Katie noted in the chat, please do join us for our next seminar on December 5th. Uh, and details are, are uh, in the in the chat. Um, and this was recorded and will be sh shareable um, within the next week or so. Um, so if you thought it was insightful and want to share it with a colleague or friend, uh, please, please do so. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Mark, for a great hour of insightful conversation and, and, uh, an understanding of what's what's working, what's not working, mostly what's not working in carbon markets and, and how to fix them. Appreciate everyone's time today. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.